Last August, as I finished my second summer serving as a missionary at the Virginia Baptist Mission Board, I found myself in a horrible predicament. I had a free Saturday with absolutely nothing planned. So, I did what any millennial would do. I slept until 11, got out of bed around 2, raided the fridge, and spent the rest of the day watching Netflix. Sounds like a pretty awesome Saturday, right? Well, if you know me, I absolutely hate being idle for any extended period of time, even just a Saturday. If there's something to do, I'd like to be out doing it. So that next week, I spent some time pondering what I could do to ensure that I didn't have another lazy, unproductive Saturday. I scoured the internet for possibilities, and then like a heavenly message from on high, I saw a Facebook ad that read, Virginians Helping Virginians. Wow, I thought. Helping folks is what I'm all about. Turns out, it was an ad for the Virginia Defense Force, which is Virginia's organized militia. Same as the National Guard and the Air National Guard, except they can only be out or called out to serve within the boundaries of the state and can't be federalized. After talking with a recruiter and doing some research into the VDF, I learned that every male resident of Virginia between the ages of 16 and 65 are actually a part of Virginia's unorganized militia, which can be mobilized at the discretion of the governor. Long story short, I ended up enlisting and successfully saved myself from at least one unproductive Saturday a month, which are now spent at drill. Now, having served in the State Guard, Old Testament accounts like today's scripture passage make me think of what it was like to walk a day in the sandals of King David's militiamen so many thousands of years ago. Like our governor, King David had the authority to exercise a great deal of power over his citizens. Sometimes he exercised it correctly, and other times he didn't. Which brings us to his infamous census in our text today. Our text this morning in 2 Samuel 24 is chock full of details and events that took place surrounding three main interconnected stages in the overall story. These main stages are the sinful census, the plague, and David's acts of atonement at Aruna's threshing floor that finally averted the plague from Israel. These events in 2 Samuel are also accounted for in 1 Chronicles 21, which was likely written a couple hundred years after our text from 2 Samuel. By examining the similarities and differences of these two accounts, we can get a better understanding of what actually happened to David and his people. While it is sometimes difficult to deal with the existence of differences and even contradictions between biblical accounts, it is important that we confront and acknowledge them. You see, when historians analyze and investigate historical accounts, they actually look for the existence of minor differences because it adds credibility to the overall historical event. Therefore, when contradictions exist within the Bible, it is as if the Holy Spirit is inviting us to dig a little deeper and spend some more time wrestling with the text in order to discern what God is saying through it. Now, I don't know how you guys feel about David. But personally, I'm a huge fan. I often find that it's difficult for me to relate to individuals in the Old Testament. But David is the exception. For contemporary Christians like you and me, King David is perhaps the most relatable individual in the Old Testament. Unlike all those other biblical heroes and heroines, biblical authors recount David's life in exceptional details. His flaws, triumphs, talents, and sins are all laid bare for the world to see. So I find it very easy to put myself in David's sandals, gaining hope and reassurance that God is forgiving, loving, merciful, and benevolent. Like me, David sins and falls short of the glory of God, yet God still loves him unconditionally. I think that these thorough accounts of David's life give modern readers a glimpse into the completeness of God's unconditional love. The events in 2 Samuel 24 strain and test David's relationship with God, yet in the end, David proves himself worthy of God's testimony of him, recounted by Paul in Acts uh, 13.22. I have found David, son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart. The census David orders is military in nature, and shows that the administrative reorganization of the country imposed during the reign of King Solomon was well on its way before David's death. In 1 Kings chapters 4 and 5, we see the fruit of David's census results and how Solomon would use them to levy taxes and 
conscript forced labor from the people. With his census, David takes his kingdom a step further from tribal military behavior and a step towards a centralized form of government where the king would act as an absolute monarch. The royal census conducted on David's behalf is a testimony to David's intent to use his nation's power for personal gain and glory. David's order to, the, to conduct the census actually weakened Israel because it further closed the gap between God's people and the surrounding nations. In ordering the census, David was deceiving himself into thinking that the possession of manpower was what made his kingdom great. Because of this selfish desire for power, David receives three options for punishment, which were to prove that God could take away the manpower David valued so highly in three years, three months, or even three days if God willed it. David is allowed to choose, but only with the understanding that any of the three would elicit the same result, the total decimation of the multitude of men that David had substituted for God as his first line of national defense. To David's credit, however, he does not choose a punishment option. Instead, he leaves the decision up to God and requests in 2 Samuel 24:14, Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into human hands. Here, David completely trusts in God's mercy, and this faith is rewarded. The author of 2 Samuel 24's apologetic tone and sympathetic nature towards David suggests that this account of events was written as a way to lift David up and protect him from the general populace. David's ordering of the census would have been public knowledge since everyone in Israel and Judah participated in it. When the plague struck the land after the census, it was clear that the people wanted to blame David to blame David for bringing the pestilence down on them. Here, 2 Samuel 24 acts as a public statement to educate the people of Israel on the realities of the situation, with a favorable view of David, of course. The author says that while David did order the census, he did so under divine instruction. Therefore, the author wants to make it known that David was only responsible for stopping the plague and saving the people. Thus, the author portrays David as a king who saves his people, not as a king who brings death and destruction on them. The author of 1 Chronicles 21, however, must have felt conflicted pointing any fingers up towards God, so instead the author points the finger of blame down towards Satan by saying that it was not God who incited David against his people, but Satan who did it. The sympathetic nature that the two authors treat David with is well-intentioned, but I do not think that they represent the entire truth of what actually happened. In the chronicler's understanding, Satan tempted David, and David should have been strong enough to fight against that temptation. Now, don't get me wrong. The Old Testament is great, but we should never try and read it out of the context with the New Testament. And wouldn't you know, James has something to say about all of this. James takes the Old Testament writer's uncertainty about who is the originator of the census order, and he goes a step further to proclaim that while God tempts no one, one is tempted by one's own desires. By removing the biblical author's biases and sympathetic agenda towards David, while also instituting James' teaching into the story, what remains is a David who is responsible for giving in to his own desires and selfish ambition. David's census was sinful, because he did not conduct it for the glory of God. The census was symbolic of David's growing love of power, and it was evidence of a transfer of the people's identity from people of God to people of David. We cannot be sure what David had in mind when he ordered the census, but it was likely to have included transgressions against his people's personal freedoms. One could even argue that by giving David repeated victories and building him up to be a mighty king, God led David to a place of temptation. However, that temptation came from within David. In Matthew 4, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness in a place of temptation. When God leads us 
When God leads us to places of temptation, he does it so that we can grow and gain victory over temptation by relying more heavily on our relationship with Christ. In this light, God leads David to a place of temptation and he gives in, only to repent and grow from the experience. By the end of 2 Samuel 24, David emerges from his personal wilderness as a more suitable king and one more permanently transformed by the ordeal. For modern day Christians, these accounts of events in David's life reveal key aspects of God's nature that provide us with hope and deepen our desire for a closer walk with Christ. The troubles that this census brought on the people of Israel, however, also illuminate an important takeaway lesson for us. Investigations into the 1990 United States Census data show that an estimated 25% of large metropolitan populations remained uncounted because of an existing fear for how the government might use the census information. 25% of these populations. Can you imagine? Now it is commonplace for people existing on the margins of society to be cautious and apprehensive of how officials may use the information they give out. Although the government requires inquiries and audits of a nation's resources, populace, and demographics in order to calculate plans to improve the quality of life of everyone, sometimes these investigations lead to very negative consequences for those on the edges of society. The information that the government uses to improve roads, schools, public transport, and welfare programs is the same data it uses to crack down on illegal activity, increase taxation, implement deportation strategies, and even calculate the manpower supplied by military drafts. When David gave in to the temptation to host the census, he did it both for his people and at the risk of his people. You see, in ancient Israel, being a soldier was a sanctified vocation that came with it a strict set of purification laws and rituals that had to be maintained in order to keep the camp clean from disease. By hosting the census and enlisting so many individuals into the militia at once, David opened up the possibility and likelihood that these purification laws would be broken, allowing disease and plague to run rampant throughout the camp. But David's census wasn't completely bad. His place of temptation was whether or not to take a step towards what he considered a stronger Israel. He was trying to do what he thought was best for the people. But he was blinded by his selfish and self-serving desires. He momentarily lost sight of the importance and value of his relationship with God. The protection, prosperity, wealth, and strength that David sought was already being provided by God. Thankfully, David was able to see his error and correct it. Now, as Baptists, we believe in a healthy separation of church and state. Because of this, we are able to support both our identities as Americans as well as our identities as Christians. We may acknowledge the necessity of government programs and initiatives, but it is vitally important for us not to give in to the temptation that stems from our patriotism. Our church must exist in a space separated from the government so that we can fully live into our Christian duty. This duty is to view everyone as Christ views them and to act accordingly. When churches like ours host and participate in programs for those living on the fringes of society, it is important for us to understand the people's hesitancies as well as the possible consequences of the programs we are trying to institute. David's census and the effects it had on the populace are important reminders for modern-day ecclesiastical institutions to always examine our programs and initiatives to guarantee that they are in the best interest of the communities and demographics God calls us to serve. We must look at our programs and policies through the eyes of those living on the margins so that everything we do helps everyone we come in contact with. A perfect example of what I'm talking about has been unfolding in the past few weeks. The Lamb's Basket, just down the road, is encountering a place of temptation. Now, in case you aren't familiar, 
The Lamb's Basket is one of the best food banks in Henrico. I mean, it is truly amazing. The Lamb's Basket is supported by Lakeside Churches, including Hatcher, where we donate food, work in the distribution center, and even sit on the board of directors. People in need can come and get upwards of 200 pounds of food to sustain their household, and they can do this twice a month. Back in college, I was serving at the Lance Basket three days a week, helping folks carry their groceries to their cars. The people that I was helping came in all shapes, sizes, and colors. I think at one time, all that was needed was to prove that they were a resident of Henrico to receive food. Then in more recent times, proof of need was required. But the inf uh, information that the Lamb's Basket collected was not distributed or reported to the government. Unfortunately now, one of its larger partners, Feedmore, is in the works of making the Lamb's Basket report on the demographics of its clients. Feedmore will then report this information to the government in order to receive larger grants to expand its potential. The problem is that when our churches start to report the data we collect for things like this, we severely limit our potential to be Christ's hands and feet in our communities. We limit the services then to only people that are legal residents with no criminal background and who are within the fringes of society enough that they don't mind their information being shared. Folks, we are called to feed the hungry, provide for the uh, thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, take care of the sick, and visit those in prison. But we must do things like this in a safe and loving environment. It should not matter if someone has a warrant, is on drugs, is here illegally, is a homosexual. None of that matters, because we are called to help them regardless. The problem then is that we cannot help them if they risk harm from coming to get help from us. Hatcher Church has to be viewed as a safe space that people can trust because otherwise we damage our Christian witness and may make it harder for others to trust Jesus. Of course, our places of temptation may not be tied to government programs. Our places of temptation may stem from selfish desires or misplaced values. Often, we use up too much of our valuable resources and energy in meetings instead of going out and being salt and light in our communities. We consider Sunday a day of rest, when historically, Sunday worship was a celebration of Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday. And the early morning Sunday worship services of the first century church were an act of offering the first fruits of the week to God before heading out to work and dispersing into the larger community. Part of the purpose of our worship services is to motivate, encourage, and inspire us to leave from this place and go out into our mission field to do God's work. And I wonder how often we waste that energy, encouragement, and motivation by sitting around in committee meetings too long or immediately running home to take naps or have lunch. These things are important. But so is the great commission that Christ bestowed on each and every one of us. Going forward, I encourage Hatcher to re-examine uh, re everything it does, every program its members contribute to on behalf of the church, and every policy it institutes. I encourage us to re-examine these things to make sure that what we are doing doesn't leave anyone out and is in the best interest of the least of these. Friends, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the your mercy and forgiveness. Lord, and that we have the opportunities to change and live more fully into the perfect example given by your Son. Open our eyes to our places of temptation and help us battle through them by relying on our relationship with you. Help us view others as you view them and treat others as you would treat them. Give us the strength to overcome our places of temptation and help us grow and mature from having battled through our wildernesses. Lord, I pray all this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.